Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. I will apologize right out of the gate that I have torch song voice. I think sometimes people wonder why we don't uh, maybe postpone recording if one of us is ill. I, suddenly I sound hoarse and I'm not even the person who has been right. ill. We already canceled last week completely. <laughs> yeah, like we're we're at the point of no return. We have to record an episode. The good news is I will tell you, I'm mostly better. Like I'm not suffering through this. My voice no. just hasn't fully recovered yet. I'm at like 85 to 90% good. Yeah. I just sound a little froggy. Yeah, and I'm fine, but for some reason, the moment I got on mic just now, my voice was like, you know what I think I want to do is have sympathy for Holly. Right, you have sympathetic frog. I understand. Uh, But we're going to carry on because that's what we do. Uh, We are going to talk about somebody that's been on my list forever, which is Georges Sand. And the popular image of Georges Sand is sort of this sexy artiste of early 1800s Paris, not entirely off base, uh, but she was, above all else, a writer of incredible output and was, in her time, incredibly famous. Her behavior and her personal style were almost as talked about as her novels, and all of these factors combined made her into a figure that was admired by many, despised by some, but it seems like fascination with her was almost universal. And uh, we should mention, Georges Sand was involved romantically with A lot of people. She was kind of a serial monogamist. Um, She would kind of bounce from one paramour to another. And that was a big influence on her work. And she wrote a lot of different works. We will not list them all because, as we said, her output was astonishing. We also won't list all of her paramours or all of her writing titles. But just know we're giving you a brief version, and I still think it's uh, pretty full of, of saucy adventure and writing. Yeah, so if we if we omit your favorite book or your favorite romance, it's not personal. <laughs> there are just a lot of them. Don't worry, Chopin is in here, which is what everybody's <laughs> thinking right now, right? Well, they're not going to leave out Chopin, no. I think that's actually how uh, how she wound up moving finally up to the top of your list, was we had been brainstorming for a thing about people described as muses, and there was the... Yeah, for a, a whole separate thing... And I was like, gosh, she's been on my list forever. Although I I had already started an episode on her. You know how I'll do that. I'll start an episode, write a few hundred to a thousand words, and then be like, I'm going to move on to something else for a little while. And then that episode sort of waits in its germination stage until I come back around on it. So in terms of what we're actually talking about today, we'll start at the beginning as we often do. Amantine Lucille Aurore Dupin was born on July 1st of 1804 in Paris, and her family and friends normally called her Aurore. Her father, Maurice Dupin, was an officer in the French army serving under Napoleon, and her mother was Sophie Delaborde, who was a bird seller's daughter. Bird selling as a profession just kind of delights me a little bit here. <laughs> Uh, Sophie and Maurice had been together for several years before Aurora was born, but they only got married a month before her birth. The two of them already had children, both with other people and together. Maurice refused to acknowledge his son from a prior relationship. That was Hippolyte Chateron. Although Maurice's mother made sure that the boy and his own mother were provided for and moved them into a house in the family property. Sophie had a daughter from a previous relationship named Caroline Delaborde, and the children that Sophie and Maurice had together before Aurora had all died in infancy. So there were a lot of members of this family, but also in the terms of the two of them together, Aurora was the first surviving child. Correct. And just before Aurora turned four, her parents had another child, this time a son named Auguste Louis. And Auguste Louis was born in Madrid as Sophie had traveled to Spain to be with Maurice. That was where Napoleon had stationed him. And then they all went back to France shortly after Aurore's birthday. That was a trip that took them through rural France during brutal famine. And it was something, uh, the images of that trip really stuck with Aurore uh, vividly for years. The baby Auguste Louis died on September 8th of 1808. That was just shy of three months old. Maurice had an accident and died eight days later after falling off a horse. And then not long after that, Sophie had to relinquish custody of Aurora to her grandmother because she just wasn't able to provide for her. 
Aurora then spent most of her childhood in Nohant in central France. And this was her family's home, and she spent a lot of time there on the family estate with her grandmother. Sophie did not leave her daughter's life, though. Uh, even though she had relinquished custody, she still would spend time at Nohant at the Chateau each summer. And Aurora would also sometimes travel to Paris for visits with her mother as well. So Aurora spent her formative years in this idyllic rural environment of Nohant, and that's I believe to have informed a lot of her writing. She was tutored by a man named Jean-Francois Deschartes as a child. That was the same person who had educated her father, and he was something of an eccentric. So she got a little haphazard sort of an education. It probably wouldn't qualify as a formal education in any sense of the phrase. She also had lessons alongside her half-brother, although it was unclear to the children exactly what their relationship was to each other for quite some time. Yeah, they're uh, reading about uh, Jean-Francois Deschartes. His involvement in her life is sometimes glossed over in this weird sort of way about what a weird education she got. I read one thing that suggested that he started dressing her in boys' clothes because that just made more sense to him to have a, a pupil that was dressed as a boy because he was only used to educating boys. I don't know if there's any actual value in that information or fact to it, um, but it is pretty widely accepted that whatever education she got from him was a little bit kooky. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And as she reached her early teenage years, Aurora started, as many kids do, to rebel. Her grandmother was very old-fashioned, and she expected ladylike behavior, and that was simply not in Aurora's nature. So the child started telling her grandmother that what she wanted to do was go to Paris and live with her mother. I feel like this is the tale as old as time, right? Like, yeah. You're not my real mom. I'm going to go where so I can be me. Not so much. Yeah. So there's some speculation that Aurora's mother, Sophie, may have supported herself with sex work when she was a teenager after her parents had both died. And it seems that grandmother chose this moment to tell Aurora about her mother's alleged profession in the midst of this rebellion, presumably as a way to try to shame or scare her into obedience. And the end result of all this conflict because Aurora still was not going to be happy staying at home, was that at the age of 13, she was sent to a convent in Paris to live with the English Augustinian sisters. And shifting from country life to being immersed wholly in a religious environment in the city had a very profound effect on the teenager. She became deeply interested in mysticism during this time. But though she seemed very, very happy at the convent, and even considered becoming a nun herself, that was a little too far uh, for what her grandmother had in mind. And so her grandmother brought her back to Noant just a couple of years later. When she was 17, Aurora inherited the family estate after her grandmother died. Sophie came back to retrieve her teenage daughter, brought her back to Paris. But at that point, Aurora was really not interested in answering to her mother. So she got married because she thought that was going to offer her some more independence. This is another story that I feel like comes up in all kinds of modern tales. And I'm like... George Somm did this before anybody else. Uh, I'm sure there were other people that did it before her, but she got married to a man named Casimir Dudevant on September 17th of 1822. And the couple were married in Paris, but they moved to Noon to settle down. And Dudevant was nine years older than Aurore. He was the son of a baron who was born out of wedlock, but he was acknowledged by his father. So in marrying him, Aurore became the Baroness Dudevant. The couple had a child in June following their wedding. This was a son they named Maurice. And for the next year, they traveled, eventually settling in Paris at the end of 1824. They kept traveling a great deal, though, including going back to Nouant for extended visits. And initially, it kind of seems like Aurore was trying to make the best out of this marriage. But over time, she grew restless and unsatisfied in her life with Dudevant. And she started to exhibit signs of what we would probably categorize as depression today. Casimir was a poor match for her for a number of reasons. Aurora was a devout reader, and the stories that she read made her long for more than her domestic life. Casimir was not that. He was not so much into the life of the mind, and he tended to find solace with other romantic interests that he found less complicated than his wife, including their housemaids. And this kind of seems like one of those cases where a couple with an age gap gets married because initially the older partner Seems cool to the younger partner, but as the younger partner matures, it turns out that they grow beyond that older partner uh, because she was pretty done with him within a few years. 
1825, they were traveling in the Pyrenees, and Aurore met a young judge named Jean-Pierre Aurelien de Cez. And the two of them were immediately attracted to one another, but he was engaged. He said that he found his fiance beautiful but dull, and Aurora, who was smart and insightful, was just fascinating to him. The two of them exchanged love letters over the next five years in what's often described as a passionate but platonic love, although there is debate about whether the platonic part was really true. Yeah, uh, we don't know. This experience of having such an intense connection to someone made it abundantly clear to Aurora that her marriage, by comparison, would never offer her the same kind of excitement or be very fulfilling. And she told Casimir about her affection for Desez and that they needed to figure out some sort of way to make their household livable. In 1826, a man named Stéphane Ajasson de Grassagne re-entered Aurora's life, and he had been a tutor of hers earlier on. But when the two of them became reacquainted, this intense attraction between them led to a physical relationship. He was probably the father of Aurora's daughter, Solange, who was born in September of 1828. In the year after her daughter was born, Aurora began writing in earnest. She penned a travel memoir, La Marraine, that's the godmother, during this time, as well as Histoire d'un Rêveur, which is Story of a Dreamer. That particular book was never finished. In the summer of 1830, Aurora met another man, this one seven years younger than she was, who would really catalyze a significant life change that the then 26-year-old Aurora had really been longing for. This was Jules Sandeau, who was an aspiring writer, and the two of them soon became romantically involved. I feel like that phrase, the two of them soon became romantically involved, can just be repeated so many times throughout this episode. Uh, This is a really significant turning point, though, for Aurora. So we're going to pause here for a quick sponsor break before we get into how her life changed. In early 1831, Aurora moved to Paris with Jules Sandeau, leaving behind her husband and her home. And she had made an arrangement with Casimir regarding this move, though that arrangement was not arrived at in a particularly amicable fashion. The Dudevant household had, as Aurora became more and more restless, become a place of persistent strife. Husband and wife argued constantly, and they only ever seemed to be happy in relationships with people outside the marriage. So, in 1831, the decision was made that Aurora would spend half of each year in Paris, switching out with life at Noant every three months. And during Aurora's times in Paris, the children were split up. So her toddler daughter Solange would stay in Noan with Casimir, and Maurice, their son, was cared for by a tutor. Aurora started to more seriously focus on writing in Paris, now writing under the pseudonym Jules Sand, or sometimes just J. Sand. That work was published in Le Figaro, which was a periodical run by Henri Latouche, who would become one of Aurora's closest friends. Latouche, and you'll sometimes see his name as De Latouche, basically asked Aurora to write these satirical pieces as a freelancer, and that marked the beginning of her professional career as a writer. There's ongoing debate about these pieces. They are generally believed to be collaborations between Aurora and Jules Sandeau, but it's unclear about exactly how much of them contributed. Yeah, uh, how much either of them wrote of any of those pieces will probably be debated forever. Uh, And this is also the period of her life when Aurora began wearing menswear. And she would write of this shift in her attire later, quote, I had a sentry box coat made of rough gray cloth with trousers and a waistcoat to match. With a gray hat and a huge cravat of woolen material, I looked exactly like a first-year student. So this was scandalous to some people, but it's also more important to note that it was flat-out illegal. Women in Paris were supposed to get a permit to wear men's clothing. That was a law that had been issued in 1800. If a woman could prove that she needed to dress in menswear for a medical reason, she could get a permit to do it. But Aurora and a handful of other women did it without a permit. They didn't try to get a permit. They wore whatever they wanted without much in the way of real consequences. That law was actually still on the books in Paris, not really enforced, though, until 2013. Yeah, uh, if you look back at articles in 2013, they're like, finally women can wear pants, which they're writing as a joke, because, of course, people had been wearing pants forever. Um, And this was a time when it seemed that Aurora was truly defining the woman that she wanted to be, and she was establishing her unique identity. 
She wasn't necessarily wearing men's clothes to cause a stir. She found them more practical and more comfortable than wearing dresses. But she did also enjoy seeing the different ways she was treated when she was wearing menswear. Her figure was not especially curvy, so she was sometimes mistaken for a man. And that was something which she seemed to quite enjoy, particularly when she could reveal to the confused observer that, in fact, she was a woman. She wrote her first novel called Indiana at the end of 1831. That was published in May of 1832 under her new pen name, which was Georges Sand. Eventually, she grew tired of Jules Sando. She broke off their relationship and moved into a new apartment nearby. Her daughter, Solange, moved in with her. Yeah, at that point, Solange was a little bit older than her her toddler age, and she would have needed more constant uh, attention. So it worked out just fine. Indiana is not, surprisingly, a story about a woman dissatisfied with her marriage. She longs for passion and adoration, and in that quest, she puts her faith in the wrong man. Uh, Spoiler alert, this is one of those classic tropes where the right man was in front of her the whole time, and the two do eventually end up together. And this novel was an instant success. This is when Aurora became famous and became publicly known as Georges Sand. so we're going to change over to addressing her by that name. Initially, she chose a pen name because she wanted people to appreciate the writing rather than marvel at the fact that a woman had written it, but soon it was really common knowledge (laughs) that this was written by a woman, and she just kind of rolled with it. Yeah, I have to wonder if her, like, constant love of revealing, like, in fact, I am not a student but a woman, uh, didn't help, you know, kind of uh, dissipate any anonymity she had been hoping for. Uh, Indiana was quickly followed by another novel, Valentine, in November of that same year. And at that point, George was kind of the it writer in Paris. So keep in mind that this is a time when novels were sort of equivalent to film or television today in terms of their prominence as entertainment. So she became something of an overnight celebrity following Indiana's publication. The Valentine of this novel is the story's heroine, and she's an aristocrat who falls in love with a poor farmer In addition to the theme of true love that can never be actualized because of a class disparity, this book also serves as a feminist critique of the poor standards of education for women. Uh, Valentine is prepared only to be a wife and nothing more. And even if she were to end up with her farmer love, she would not be prepared well for the rigors of that kind of a life. In early 1833, Georges Sand had a brief romantic relationship with a woman, and this was the actress Marie Dorval. This was a heady time for Sand. Newly famous and free from the domestic life that she had fled, she really had her pick of suitors. 1833 was also the year that Georges published her third novel, Lelia. And not long after she began her relationship with Dorval, Sand met fellow writer Alfred de Musset, who also became her lover, and with whom she had an on-again, off-again romance that would rival any fiction. Lelia gave readers a heroine who was a lot like Sand herself an iconoclast who did not care about societal convention. The titular character finds happiness neither with her many love affairs nor in being celibate. When Lelia tells her courtesan sister of this whole situation, the sister suggests that Lelia should become a courtesan herself. This catalyzes a plot that involves a poet who's in love with Lelia, whose life falls apart after she tries to seduce him and then betrays him. I've not read this book. It sounds very complicated to me. Uh, Lelia was also panned by the press. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, it, it, in some ways, she is pulling from her own life and her various relationships. Like, it is not a surprise that at a time when she has met Alfred de Musée, with whom she had a very volatile relationship, uh, that she was also writing about these sort of complicated romantic matters. Um, the end of 1833 and the beginning of 1834 were very chaotic and fraught. Georges and Musset decided to go away to Italy, but that trip turned very sour. And this really sounds like a telenovela plot. Things went completely awry, first when Georges got dysentery. Musset then began having episodes of delirium because it turned out he had typhoid fever. Then, Georges began an affair with the Italian doctor who came to treat Musset. His name was Luigi Pagello. And when Musset recovered enough to return to Paris, Sand decided that she would stay behind in Venice with her new beloved doctor. Three months after Musset's return to Paris, Georges also felt as though she could go back to France, particularly to see her children. 
So in June of 1834, she left Italy for Paris. She brought the doctor with her. But not long after getting there, George split up with him to return to Musée, although the reunion lasted less than a month. Um, I, I certainly would not recommend it as a piece of, of historical information, but if you have ever seen or have not seen the movie Impromptu, which is about Georges Sand, in which the incomparable Judy Davis plays Georges, um, mm. Mandy Patinkin plays Musée, and he is spectacular. Um you get a sense of all of their levels of drama when the two of them are together on screen. Throughout all of this drama, though, in her personal life, Sand was writing and publishing. She published a series of stories in the literary magazine Revue des Deux Mondes during her turbulent 1834, including Léon, Léoni, and Jacques. And at the beginning of 1835, Sand and Musée reunited one last time, but their relationship was completely over by March of that year. Post-musée, Georges began seeing a lawyer in Noël named Louis Michel. The next big event in Georges Sand's life was finally legally separating herself from Casimir Dudevant. This was a significant legal battle. Her lawyer, Paramore, could not continue their relationship. He was married. He did not wish to disrupt his life with a long-term affair. But he did manage Georges' legal separation before they split up, uh, getting significant judgment wins for her. In July 1836, the separation, although it was not a divorce, was finally settled. The two key aspects of the legal decision that uh, her lawyer, Louis Michel, had fought for were that A, Georges got custody of the children, and B, her chateau and property in Noon reverted entirely back to her. Her son Maurice would have been 13 at this point, and Solange was seven on the verge of turning eight. And once she had married Dudevant, he had become the controller of the family finances. So she had been given an allowance out of what was rightfully her own inheritance. Uh, so that was what she was uh, seeking to, to reverse at this point. Even after the separation, Son did provide her husband with an annual income. Around this time, San met previous podcast subject Franz Liszt and his paramour Marie Dagou. Franz and Marie traveled to Noant to visit San twice in 1837, and it was through this friendship that George met the man she's most often associated with, who we referenced back at the top of the show, Friedrich Chopin. The friendship with Marie in particular, would disintegrate in time. It was revealed to Georges that she had been gossiping about her and generally scheming against her. Sand eventually wrote, quote, your understanding of friendship is different than mine. You just won't give up being a beautiful and witty woman who slaughters and smashes all the others. And while Sand was instantly taken with Chopin when she met him, largely because of his musical skill, that interest was not initially reciprocated. In a letter that he wrote to family, Chopin wrote, something about her repels me. But by May of 1838, the two were lovers. They stayed together for nine years, and both of them were incredibly productive during their romance. It's kind of considered like their golden period for both of them as creators. Their relationship was perplexing to their friends at first. Chopin was quiet and reserved with delicate health. He was the polar opposite of Georges, who lived however she wished and was unafraid of just about everything. There were whispers in their social circle that the match might take a toll on Chopin, who was perceived to be pretty fragile. And during their first winter together, she took him, along with her two children, to Majorca to stay in a monastery. The weather and the meager accommodations there were really rough on the composer. He coughed up blood throughout this whole stay. After that debacle, they returned to Nouant, where Georges fawned over Frederick and nursed him back to health. In addition to Chopin, Sans' friendship with Liszt and Dagou connected her to many of Europe's most popular writers and artists. Many of those people spent time with her at the Chateau in Noon, including Honoré de Balzac and Eugène Delacroix, who employed her son Maurice as an apprentice for a time. In April of 1840, Georges Sand tried her hand at a different kind of writing, which was theater, and this did not go so well. Her play, Cosima, which was also titled La Han dans l'amour, Hate in Love, was a flop. In 1841, Sand found herself in a battle with the leadership of the Revue des Deux Mondes over her new novel, Horace. The periodical's editor had no wish to publish this work, and this led to Georges Sand developing her own literary periodical, Revue Independent, 
in which Pierre Leroux and Louis Viardot were her partners. This offered her a vehicle to publish her own work whenever she wanted and as she saw fit. She had an increasing interest in political matters at this point, and so Georges Sand was inspired in 1844 to start another periodical. While La Revue Independente was an outlet for her romantic literary work, her second paper, Le Clareur, which is The Scout, gave her a place to print her increasingly political and particularly socialist writing. In 1847, after nine years together, a permanent rift formed between Sand and Chopin. In February of that year, Sand and her daughter Solange sat for sculptor Auguste Clésinier, and Solange and the sculptor fell madly in love. This was a little bit complicated because Solange was engaged to someone else, but she broke off that relationship to marry Clésinier three months after meeting him. Two months after the wedding, which Georges had not really supported, the writer got into a huge fight over money with her daughter and her new son-in-law, Clésinier pulled a gun and threatened Sand. In the midst of this high-tension family conflict, it was Solange and not Georges that Chopin ultimately sided with. He broke up with Sand by letter, and that's Sand's version, at least. Chopin had come to think of Solange as his own daughter, and he was not willing to cut her out of his life. When the composer and the writer did see each other again the year after their breakup, uh, that's kind of written about as though they kind of ran into each other accidentally, Chopin gave Georges the news that Solange had given birth to a daughter. That was to be the last time that Sand and Chopin saw each other. Chopin died on October 17th, 1849, of tuberculosis. Clésinger actually cast his death mask. And Georges Sand did not attend Chopin's funeral, Many people actually blamed her for his death, even though his health improved considerably during his time at Noong after that first slightly disastrous winter. Sand did, however, later reconcile with her daughter. Next, we will talk about Georges Sand's life after Chopin. But first, we're going to pause for a word from one of our sponsors, because we could not do this show without them. <laughs> The wave of revolutions that began in France in February 1848 led to the overthrow of King Louis-Philippe and the rise of the Second Republic. The Second Republic, which Sand believed would be closely aligned with her own personal ideals, drew her back to Paris, and she started another new periodical there, La Cause du Peuple, The Cause of the People. She also wrote for a number of other socialist papers during that time. But in the months after the overthrow of the monarchy, it became clear that the new government of France was a lot more conservative than Sand had hoped it would be. She was completely disillusioned by this turn of events, and she went back to Noat, where she spent most of her time for the rest of her life. The rustic short novel, François Le Champy, was published in 1848. It is the story of a champy, that is a nickname that translates literally to little mushroom, but in this context, it refers to a country orphan. This book was very popular, and in 1849, it was staged as a play at the Odeon Theater in Paris. And unlike her earlier foray into theater, Son met with great success with Francois on the stage. For Christmas in 1849, Son's son Maurice invited his friend, Alexandre Manceau, to Noant. Manceau, who was an engraver, moved into the chateau permanently as Georges' companion, and for the next two years... They greeted an assortment of visitors in Noat. They put on shows in the parlor theater there. In 1852, after Napoleon III came to power, Georges used her considerable influence to broker pardons from the new emperor for many of his political opponents. She continued to advocate politically with the Bonaparte family on behalf of peasants and the working class. And as a consequence, she actually became pretty good friends with Prince Jérôme Napoleon, the cousin of Napoleon III. In 1854, Georges' autobiography, Histoire de ma vie, began publishing in installments in the journal La Presse. The story of her life spooled out over the course of 138 installments, and then it was published in its entirety in book form over the course of 20 volumes, which gives you a sense of why we're not mentioning all of the individual <laughs> details. <laughs> As she approached her 50s, Georges wanted to ensure that her family would be taken care of long-term after her death. And she began to work on selling the rights to future publication royalties for her work in an effort to secure financial stability for the family. Family life itself remained complex. 
1853, Solange had entrusted Georges with the care of her second daughter, Jeanne, who went by Nini. And as the marriage between Solange and her sculptor husband broke down, Clesinger showed up at Noel to take the child from Sand, catalyzing a custody battle over the five-year-old. And though Sand was able to get custody of Nini after a month-long legal fight, the child contracted scarlet fever soon after and died. In 1855, Sand, who had continued to write prolifically throughout all of these personal dramas, signed a 10-book deal with Hachette. Three years later, she also made up with Francois Boulos, who was the editor at Revue des Deux Mans, that she had fallen out with years earlier. The literary magazine once again started publishing her work, starting with L'Homme de la Neige, or The Snowman, in 1858. In 1859, Sand set off a minor literary war when she published Elle et Lui, that's her and him, in installments. And this was a fictionalized version of her romance with Alfred de Musée years earlier. Musée had died two years prior to Sand's story coming out. Keep in mind, this whole thing was more than 20 years after their relationship, and Musée had had his say when he published his version of their story in 1836, but... Just the same, Saul's story earned the ire of Musée's brother, who wrote his own book titled Louis et Elle, and once again represented his brother's side of the story. Despite the skirmish over her past romance, in 1859, Saul remained a celebrity and a success. At the end of that year, one of the first celebrity-licensed luxury scents was created. That was Eau de Georges Sand for the body and for the hanky. Yet another illustrious writer was still to step into Georges' life, and that was Gustave Flaubert. The two met in 1860 while Sand was visiting Paris, later became friends, and went on to exchange letters for years. This is perhaps a surprising friendship, since Flaubert's work Madame Bovary, which came out in 1856, seemed to mock the very sort of woman Georges Sand writes about in her books, and indeed presented herself as. Sand, like her heroines, was obsessed with romance, with emotions, with this search for passion. And if you have read Madame Bovary, you know that Emma Bovary is ultimately consumed by those very behaviors. And it is not always terribly flattering of her. Um, We should note that the interpretation of Flaubert's intent had been argued since the book's publication. And that quote that you'll often see attributed to him, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, might indicate that he was perhaps less condescending about romanticism than it might appear at first glance. Regardless, the writers seem to adore each other, despite the obviously different points of view that were represented in their correspondence. Flaubert refers to Saint as dear master. At one point, as they debated politics, he wrote, quote, ah, dear good master, if you could only hate, that is what you lack, hate. In spite of your great sphinx eyes, you have seen the world through a golden color. Their letters, uh, which you can read online, are absolutely darling. Some of them are, um, uh, it's a very playful and sweet correspondence. It kind of reminds me of the text that you might send to, you know, your, your best friend and back and forth. The two of them tease and chastise each other. And at one point in 1866, Flaubert suggests that if they stop joking in their letters, Sand will become instantly bored with him. And they often just seem to be trying to figure out times when their schedules intersect so that they can have dinner together. But it's all peppered throughout discussions of the human soul and the afterlife and the nature of art. And as I said, it's a very charming read. In 1861, Georges and Solange had another falling out. This time, Georges accused Solange of basically allowing a man to pay to keep her. The two women had continued to butt heads over money, and Solange had confided her financial problems to her mother. She got a less than cordial reply by letter that read in part, quote, you should live simply or learn to work. To anything anyone ever says to you, you reply that it's impossible. My only advice is this, both privation and work require a strong will. And when you say how boring, I've got nothing more to say. As a result of these disagreements, the two women did not speak for four years. Yeah, they, uh, a classic mother and daughter conflict relationship. Georges' son Maurice also had some sort of falling out with Alexandre Monceau, that is his his friend uh, who had become Georges Sand's companion and lover. And he asked that his former friend leave Noon. And it is unclear why this ultimatum was given. It is possible that Maurice, who had married in 1862, suddenly saw Manceau as a freeloader in his mother's world. But 
We have to give Manso his due. He was absolutely devoted to Georges Sand. Many men had fallen in love with her during her life, but Manso supported her in ways that few people ever experience in a partner. Sand was a constant and prolific writer. She turned out 20 pages a day, every day. Because the chateau had constant guests that had needs and cost money, and because she paid allowances to her children and rented places in Paris, she just needed a constant stream of income, so she wrote. Even when a party went on at the chateau until the wee hours, she would then write and write until sunrise. And when she would sit down for a long session, Manso would bring her everything she might need. Her paper and her ink, her cigarette papers and tobacco, any refreshments she might need. He actually purchased a small cottage nearby for them to escape to when the chateau got too crowded with guests for her to be able to write. In short, he enabled her to continue her career uninterrupted in the years that they were together. Yeah, he was, in, like, uh, so supportive. Like, it's like what everybody dreams of in a a partner that supports him and keeps him going and unconditionally loves them. He was there for all of that. So when Maurice insisted that Manceau had to leave Noon, that is exactly what happened. And Georges Sand left with him. And after they traveled for a bit, the pair landed in Palaiso, just outside of Paris. Manceau died of tuberculosis a year later, but it would be two more years before Georges Sand would return to Noon. The last 10 years of her life were a mix of the life that she loved so much at Noant and travel and politics. She criticized both the radical Paris Commune government, which ruled for several months in 1871, and the toppling of that government because of the violent and bloody conflict that took place. She and her family fled Noant briefly due to a smallpox scare, and she entertained loads of visitors at the Chateau, as always. She still wrote constantly along with all of that. At 69, she wrote Conte d'une grand-mère, Tales of a Grandmother. In late 1875, Sand organized all of her work so it could be published as a complete collection, and she wrote a preface for it. Soon thereafter, she started work on a new novel, Albine Fiori. She died on June 8, 1876, just a few weeks shy of her 72nd birthday. In her lifetime, Sand wrote more than 50 novels, more than a dozen play, her extensive autobiography, and innumerable pamphlets, essays, and letters. In 1844, Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote a poem titled To Georges Sand, A Recognition, in celebration of the controversial writer's ability to carve out her own exceptional life that defied gender norms. Here's how that poem reads. Thou large-brained woman and large-hearted man, self-called Georges Sand, whose soul, amid the lions of thy tumultuous senses, moans defiance and answers roar for roar as spirits can. I would some mild miraculous thunder ran above the applauded circus, an appliance of thine own nobler nature's strength and science, drawing to pinions white as wings of swan from thy strong shoulders to amaze the place with holier light, that thou to woman's claim and man's mightst join besides the angel's grace of a pure genius sanctified from blame till child and maiden pressed to thine embrace to kiss upon thy lips a stain fame. Oh, Georges Sand, I love you so much. <laughs> I adore her. Um, uh, it's funny because I, I don't um, super love her novels. Sure. This is not my jam. But I love her as a person and a, her biography. I think she's kind of fabulous in the way that, a uh, you know, saucy woman who sets out to make her own life very much outside of the norms of yep. uh, societal mores. Uh, it's pretty fun. And, uh, yeah. I can't say I would I would want her romantic life. That sounds exhausting. But, you know, she's still very fun. Yeah, th- there are moments where I'm like, that sounds uh, like a lot of fun. And other moments where I'm like, okay, I'm tired now. <laughs> right. I just want to lie down. I mean, I love the idea. Like, I, oh, that's another good time travel thing. I would love the chance to visit Noel and, like, hang out at some of her epic, like, perpetual parties that seem mm-hmm. to be going on there with lots of interesting, fun, smart people, right? Can I just hang out at Noel with Delacroix mm-hmm. for a while? That sounds great. I have some listener mail that is not about Georges Sand. Okay. Okay. 
but is sort of about another woman that I'm a, a fan of in history. This is from our listener, Blaze, and she writes, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I was in a thrift store in a small town in northern New Mexico recently, and I came across the enclosed postcards related to Queen Victoria and her clothing. I thought you, especially Holly, would enjoy them, so I'm sending them along. I've never been to London, but I'm glad someone none of us have ever met went to the Museum of London and bought postcards that they never managed to send. I hope you also enjoy this card from the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta. Balloons are a big deal in New Mexico. Thanks for all your hard work and sharing history with the masses. I've been listening to the show since 2013, and you and the previous hosts have helped me through some really lonely times. I appreciate you. All the best, Blaze. That's so cool. Blaze, thank you so much. There are um, beautiful pictures. There are um, of Queen Victoria, uh, some of her later in life garments that were on display at um, the Museum of London at some point in time, 1997. Her Jubilee portrait, which I love. Some bonnets from the era. They are the only known examples of Queen Victoria's bonnets before 1861, uh, which are beautiful. One of them has a beautiful rose braid or a rose ribbon trim. Uh, anyway, I love these, of course, because hello. Uh, thank you so much, Blaze, for sending those. Those are awesome. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can also find us everywhere on social media as Missed in History. If you would like to subscribe to the show, that sounds just grand. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.